Welcome back to part two of my Rob Roy vertical steam engine build. In this episode, I need to build a crosshead and a pair of crosshead slide guides to connect to the piston rod. For the slides, I cut two lengths of 01 tall steel, which was already precision ground to my required dimensions. The shape and style of the crosshead will be based on this photo, which I took of a loco, as I like the shape of this design. It also reflects the fact that the cylinder is from a loco in the first place. I sketched up a more detailed drawing and sourced a brass billet to begin making the crosshead. This was set up and a chunk sawn off on the bandsaw, ready to take to the mill. The block will be milled to suit the dimensions of the slides, so it's a close running fit to keep the piston rod parallel with the cylinder to prevent wear from the oscillation motion of the conrod. The block was firstly squared off and then milled down to size and then the two slots were milled out to the dimensions on my sketch. A deep slot was then cut down into the block where the small end of the conrod would be located using a two flute slot cutting end mill. The block was then marked out in readiness for drilling the pinion hole and creating the shape on the milling machine. This was then mounted in the milling vise and the material machined away to my mark outlines. Once one side was done, it was flipped around and the opposite side was milled in the same manner. The internal radius was formed by progressively rotating the part in the vise with the use of a temporary shaft in the centre hole until the rough curve was formed. You can see that it's made up of multiple flat surfaces. The end where the piston rod will attach needs to also have a radius on the internal corners so this was done by using a ball nosed end mill to remove the brass down to size. This was then set up centrally in the four jaw chuck on the lathe and the hole for the piston rod was drilled and tapped out to M5. The centre boss needs to have the corners turned away, so a piece of high speed steel was shaped on the bench grinder to give clearance into the recess and also a small angle on the tip of the tool to form a 90 degree shoulder onto the corner of the turned boss. This was then gently turned away to the base dimension of the milled slots to create the finished shape and then the internal radius was tidied up with a small file until it was smooth. The front and rear surfaces were then milled away to final drawing specs to complete the style of the design. I now needed to find a way of mounting the guide rails onto the chassis of the machine and hold them parallel in position. So mounting holes were drilled and two raising blocks were made which would become the supports. These were measured up and cut off on the bandsaw 
before bluing and marking out on the surface table. Holes were drilled and tapped to correspond to the holes in the guide rails and then, with the use of parallels and clamps, the spacers were test fitted for size. The spacers were made just a few thou over size to allow for final readjustment at the final fitting stage. They were then taken back to the mill for shaping and again my ball ended cutter used to form the internal radiuses. The engine chassis was then marked out and clearance holes for M3 screws were drilled. The engine was then reassembled and the spacers were marked by using a drill through the screw holes to gently spot mark the hole positions by tapping with a hammer while rotating the drill. I could then remove the assembly of parallels and spacer blocks which were used to set up the position. Next up was the connecting rod. This was marked out and taken to the bandsaw for removal of excess material and the base of the big end was drilled and tapped out. A 12mm reamer was used to form the hole for the bearing insert and then a length of phosphor bronze was selected which will be used to make the insert. This was chucked up in the lathe and the diameter turned down to be a press fit into the reamed hole. This was then parted off using the rear tool post and then the cut end was also cleaned up in the lathe and brought to final length. A tiny section was turned away so that it would sit squarely in the hole and then the bearing insert was firmly squeezed into the bore using my vice. This was now ready to be taken back to the mill for slitting through the centre. A 1mm slitting saw was set up and the conrod was sawn through in the centre of the bearing. Here you can see the split bearing being liberated from the hole as the tension of the press fit is released. The two halves of the split bearing were reseated and set with locking compound for the next machining process and then reassembled and clamped into position. <laughs> 
The next job will be to drill and ream the hole so that it can then be split and reassembled around the crank journal. Once the locking compound had set overnight, the bearing was then drilled and reamed out to 6mm. I could now begin the shaping of the conrod, which was roughed out on the mill before finishing to dimension. Here you can see the basic shape of the conrod making progress. So it was time to set up the rotary table and start forming the round end of the rod to suit the slot in the crosshead. A centre pin was made to suit the rotary table and the bearing hole in the end of the con rod. And this was clamped to the table using a shim of aluminium underneath to raise it from the bed to allow the cutter to clear the underside. And progressive cuts were made to round off the end to final dimensions. This wasn't critical as long as the flat on the top was removed I knew it would clear the internal slot. The small end was then milled down to size and the conrod was set up using an adjustable stud to set the correct angle which I eyeballed using a parallel on top of the vise. The unwanted stock was then machined away on both sides to create a nice tapered shaft to the connecting rod. Another length of phosphor bronze was then chucked to make the bearing for the small end. This didn't need to be split as it will be attached via a pin to the crosshead so it was simply drilled out progressively and then reamed to size. It was then faced and turned again to be a press fit into the bore on the conrod finally being parted off to the desired length. The bearing was inserted into the end of the conrod and then the job was cleaned up to remove any machining marks and to smooth out the radiuses on the shoulders. Here you can see the finished item where I have filed chamfers on the edges to improve the appearance. A hole has been drilled at an angle into the shaft and then another hole was drilled from the base right through the bearing to meet this hole. This is to allow oil to be inserted to keep the bearing lubricated when in use. The end has been tapped out to allow a grub screw to be fitted to prevent the oil from leaking straight out. A piece of steel hex bar was mounted in the chuck to make the connecting pin and turned down to suit the bearing and the crosshead. The bar also had the end of the shank reduced 
to suit a 5mm thread for the locking nut when assembled. This was threaded using my die holder in the tailstock and turning the lathe mandrel by hand. Once completed, the pin was parted from the stock and then turned around in the chuck so that the face could be cleaned up and a chamfer put on the head of the bolt for appearance. It was a tight squeeze to fit the tool in so close to the chuck, but the chamfer turned out nicely. Here the components have been assembled for a test fit and the crosshead and conrod fit nicely together. There will need to be a few tweaks on final assembly, but I'm happy with my progress so far. Well that's about it for part 2, as this video is already long enough. So please join me again in part 3, where I will begin work on the steam chest and the valve assembly. And then I need to make the valve stem and the eccentric connecting rod, the valve stem guide and the piston, the oil hooks, the flywheel. Thanks for watching. See you in part 3.